discourse in Matthew 21, 24, which we'll look at tomorrow night. Luke 21, Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus warned about false teachers, false prophets, false Christs. Now, when I was a young Christian, it had been my basic assumption that that meant Jehovah's Witnesses. That meant Mormons. That meant things like this. Well, I have no doubt that the proliferation of cults that we've seen in the last century, particularly the last 20 years, is of itself of prophetic significance. I don't question that. But those are not the false teachers and false prophets he was mainly warning of. He was warning of those who would come in the last days, if possible, to deceive the elect. Now, some, of course, have said it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. That's a lie in itself. As we'll look at tomorrow, that is a lie. Jesus wouldn't warn about something so much if it was not even a possibility to happen. However, he warned about ones who would come to deceive Christians. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, if they deceive a Christian, it's basically somebody who's newly saved, doesn't know anything. They're not going to get somebody who's been saved three years or four years or five years. Cults. Not a pleasant subject. There is a theological definition of cults and a sociological definition of cults. The two, at some point, inevitably converge. Turn with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, please. Now, I mean this. Each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I of Paul, I of Cephas, I have a polis, I have Christ. Those who were saying, I have Christ, were the ones saying, we don't have any leadership or any need for leadership. Jesus is our leader, full stop. We don't recognize any pastoral authority. There were some who were saying that. Others were saying, he's mine, he's my, he's my, making a man a guru. What a cult does, what a cult does is the focus is shifted onto a man. Sometimes even a dead man. There are cults today, I mean evangelical cults, that are more popular now than when their founders were alive. The Assemblies of God rejected the ideas of people like William Branham when Branham was around. The ideas of E.W. Kenyon were abhorrent to mainstream Pentecostals. The Manifest Sons, Latter-day Reign deceptions, Restorationism, Kingdom Now, and the rest of it, these things were popularly rejected by the main Pentecostal denominations, including the Assemblies of God in the 40s and 50s. They were seen as cultic. Now, these same things, once seen as cultic and heretical, have become increasingly mainstream. And there are people today who are Branhamites. The leader of the cult could be a dead person. But what we're talking about tonight are not Jehovah's Witness cults or not Mormon cults. We're talking about cults where people believe the true gospel. When somebody is saved through one of these groups, there's a problem. When a Mormon is saved, no problem. Joseph Smith was a false prophet. The whole Mormon church is gone. It's a lie. Forget it. When a Jehovah's Witness gets saved, no problem. Brigham Young, Charles Tazzy Russell were false prophets. The whole Watchtower Society is finished. Forget it. But when people are born again through a Christian cult, you have a big problem. Groups that are theologically churches 
but sociologically cults. Eventually, these groups, which are theologically churches, but sociologically cultic, eventually they become heretical. Eventually, these groups get into apostate doctrine. But in the beginning, they begin with the true gospel. When somebody is born again to one of these groups, the leaders or the leader has a tremendous amount of spiritual and psychological influence and even control over the person. Because you really were born again. You understand? You really were born again through that group. I was born again through the children of God. For the first five years of my Christian life, I was involved with groups like that. Another one was the Church of Bible Understanding. Another Christian cult is called Bible Speak, sometimes called Greater Grace. Here in Melbourne, there are at least two active Christian cults. One is Longfield's place, Lloyd Longfield and Simon Longfield, that theater down off Spring Street. And the other is David Christ, the so-called Messianic Apostle. At least there's probably others. They understand what makes these things so dangerous and so bad is they preach the true gospel. You understand? You can't write them off entirely the way you write off the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons entirely. There's a big problem. The people who have been in these groups and the people who have been saved through these groups are in bondage. They're in spiritual and psychological bondage to these groups. Let's understand how it works. Notice the apostles like Paul went against this mentality. Did Paul save you? It's Jesus who saves. It's the gospel who saves. It's not a church. The Roman Catholic Church claims it is the instrument of salvation. That the sacraments administered by their priests are how people are saved. Ex opere, operato. Well, these groups will preach Christ. But somehow the distinction is not made between the Christ and the cult. Let's look at their characteristic. Paul has a go at the first characteristic. Something that in later in Galatians, he calls a deed of the flesh. Turn to Galatians, please. Chapter 5. Verse 20. Factions. Sometimes translated partyism, perhaps better translated this way. The first mark of a cult, the heat of the flesh, which all calls the sin of party spirit. The sin of party spirit is where the group claims a monopoly on biblical truth. With the party spirit and what will engender the party spirit, is this some form of Gnosticism from the Greek word Gnosos meaning mystical knowledge the Gnosticism in the Roman Catholic Church is called the census plenior now somebody asked me so I'll only mention it in passing watch out for Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustiger of Paris he's an ethnic Jew and he's quite potentially the next or a future Pope I'm not saying he will be the false prophet of Revelation. I'm simply saying, if you're going to watch anybody, watch him. In the Roman Catholic Church, it's called the census plenior, the fullest sense of Scripture. Now, there is a fullest sense of Scripture. There is. But what they claim is, the Pope, as the heir of Peter, has the infallible insight to define what it is and determine doctrine on that basis. In Gnosticism, it is not important what the Bible says, exegetically. It's important what the leader says about the Bible. The Vineyard Movement, John Wimber's movement, is based on Christian Gnosticism, a heresy in the early church. For instance, the basic teaching of the Vineyard and the Latter-day Rain Movement and the Kansas City Prophets, the Restoration, is Joel's army. They run on the cities, they rush on the walls. Great is the army who carries his word, which is compared to locusts. 
Now in its Sitzim Leben, in its historical setting, this was Nebuchadnezzar's army. An army that God used to judge an irrepentant Judah. But also, it's a type of the army of Antichrist in Revelation, the locusts. The same locust Revelation picks out of Joel. So whatever this army is in the last days, it's the army of Antichrist. And in chapter 2, verse 20 of Joel, God says, I will destroy it. Its stench will go into heaven. I will cast it into the western sea. The vineyard movement teaches it's them. You want to be part of an army God's going to judge and destroy? Join the vineyard movement. Join the manifest sons of God. Latter-day rain movement. It doesn't matter what the Bible says it is. It only matters what the Nassos says it means. God has shown me. Copeland and Hagen both come from Kenyan. Forget about that Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The Kenyanites, that's what Copeland and Hagen are. God has shown me that Satan got the victory on the cross, not Jesus. Jesus was tortured in hell for three days and three nights of one nature with Satan. Then this demon, whom Jesus, was born again in hell. Then he rose from the dead. Different Jesus, different gospel, denying the master who bought them. God has shown me. The prosperity preachers, God has shown me. These things are all cultic. Turn, please, to Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 20, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And right after this, we have the Greek word parasogzusin that we spoke of last week. They put truth next to error in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. They make the interpretation of things like biblical prophecy a matter of their own interpretation. It's not important what the Bible says. It is important what the leader says it says. Okay? Now, when you have these two things together, look out. A third thing is going to come. It is inevitable a third thing will come. Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Historically, we can't be sure who they were. Some have speculated, they're followers of someone named Nicklaus, who some have speculated was one of the deacons in Acts chapter 6, but nobody knows. Those are things from tradition. What we do know is what Nicolaitanism means in Greek. I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nico, suppression of the laity people. They set themselves up as overlords. Turn to Ezekiel 34. Verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, saying, Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now the Hebrew word for shepherd and pastor is the same word. A. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat flock, you, the fat sheep, without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the disease you have not healed. The broken you've not bound up, the scattered you've not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. Biblical leadership is by example, not lording it over. Jesus castigated the Pharisees for this, yet it got into the early church. When you see party spirit, it is normally locked to something called Gnosticism. Oh, but he understands the Bible better than we do. Now, in some cases, I know one case where the guy went, went totally nuts and said things that were utter, utterly heretical, yet he did have a lot of insight into the Bible. Be careful of leaders who believe their own publicity. When somebody who is genuinely gifted lets people put him on a pedestal, look out. Yeah, but we, we don't understand what he's doing, but he's, he's closer to God than we are. He understands. He has more insight. That may be true, but when you see the person doing things directly contrary to Scripture, choose to say whom you will serve. Yet by that point, they're usually too far in bondage. 
The next thing is Nicolaitanism, the heavy shepherding. Who are you to question us? Who are you to challenge us? You have a spirit of rebellion. Let me explain to you about the personality type of a cult leader. The personality type of a cult leader, I'm sure a forensic psychiatrist would tell you the same thing. The personality type of a cult leader is virtually identical to the personality type of a dictator. There have been forensic psychological autopsies on many dictators, including Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. One thing, when, they did, when, when the team of psychiatrists who did the forensic analysis on the personality of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, they did this in the 1940s for the British and American allies. They were united in agreeing, the team of psychiatrists who looked at Hitler and looked at what he wrote and the way he behaved and, and, and interviewed Hess, people who knew him and stuff, who defected to, to the West. Neither Hitler nor Stalin would have had the guts to fight in the Battle of Stalingrad or the, or the Battle of the Bulge. They certainly would not have had the guts to do in concentration camps what they had others doing. You understand? Cult leaders are like dictators. They are personally insecure. A cult leader is a personally insecure person who surrounds himself by others more insecure than he is so that he may control them and through them they go to the people. A cult leader will very rarely deal with you without his honchos with him to shout you down. A cult leader will send one of his parakeets who will just basically ape everything the cult leader tells him. The cult leader is insecure and the people, his agents, his deputies, will always be insecure people, easily manipulated. Now, not everybody is the same, but one thing is for sure, when you're born again, you begin to change spiritually, and as you change spiritually, you will change psychologically. God changes people from the inside out. As you grow in Jesus, you become secure in Christ, and then you become who secure in who you are in Christ. In a cult, this fails to happen. We're talking about Christian cults, groups that are, again, in the beginning, theologically churches, but sociologically cults. The people don't become secure in Christ. The security becomes based on their relationship to this leader. You understand? It is only a matter of degrees, but they're all the same. The only difference between most of the house church movements who are into restoration theology, the ones in England are the ones led by Gerald Coates and, and, and uh, Bryn Jones and Roger Foster, Frontiers, Pioneer People, these things, Ixus. It's only a matter of degrees how cultic they are, but they all go the same way. The only thing about Jehovah's Witnesses or David Koresh is they've gone further down the road. Given enough time, although these churches are theologically churches, and only sociologically cults, given enough time, they will get into heretical doctrine. I don't just mean minor error. I mean they'll get into some fundamental error, given enough time. David Berg, Children of God, did that. Stuart Trail, the Church of Bible Understanding, did that. Given enough time, you'll find significant doctrinal error. But that's only the beginning. These people are insecure. So what you will find is this. They will fear people who know things they do not. We should not make a God out of education by any means. Pay attention. Apollos and Paul were formally educated. Peter and John were not. Yet the apostolic authority that Peter and John had was no less than what Paul had. However, as Peter says in his epistle, these things are complicated. It's better for Paul to explain them. Once somebody's background, even intellect, had been crucified, once you learn to trust Christ and not your intellect, your intellect becomes a very good servant. Intellect is a good servant, but a dangerous master. Okay? But ignorance is a deadly master. Hear what I said? Intellect is a bad master. Good servant, bad master. 
ignorance is neither a good servant and it's a deadly master. You will find these people automatically demeaning anything like a seminary, a Bible college. Somebody who reads Greek, he'll fear you. And he'll have to demean you and put you down in that group. And have others laugh at you because he knows you know something he doesn't. He knows you can read the original Greek. A lot of Greek Christians here in Melbourne. Or Hebrew. Or you've been to seminary. You, you <laughs> You're a threat to him. Much like dictators, they fear people who know something they don't. So they have to demean it. You don't need this. And they'll point out things that are in and of themselves true. Look at that. The universities are filled with PhDs who know Greek and Hebrew on their way to hell. They aren't even saved. They'll, they'll, they'll play that up. But they won't look at the other side of the coin. They'll only emphasize the things that suit their purpose to control people. You are dealing with a personally insecure person who can only control people by keeping them insecure. Ultimately, they will come to this doctrinal error themselves. But inevitably, at some point, you will find one of two things, if not both, happening. In these groups, you will find one of two things probably both happening. The first is financial misconduct. Usually it's Ezekiel 34. In fact, almost always. You've butchered the sheep to live well yourself, but look how they live. And there's one in, 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 in America. He had five airplanes. Holidays in the Bahamas with his second wife. The people were living in rat-infested slums and high-crime neighborhoods in the worst neighborhoods in New York City, cleaning carpets 14 hours a day, giving all the money to the cult. Supposedly saying it was for the children in Haiti. Well, maybe some of it was, but it was also for five airplanes. But only he and his wife flew. Financial misconduct is the first. You will eventually, almost inevitably, you'll eventually find that disparity. Ezekiel 34 warns about it. They're butchering the sheep to give themselves... A lifestyle that they probably couldn't get in the secular world because they wouldn't be clever enough. Much like most of the Pentecostal ministers today. And I'm a Pentecostal myself. I assure you that 90% of the Pentecostal ministers would not have the lifestyles they have if they weren't Pentecostal ministers. They wouldn't be good enough to make it in a secular business trade or profession. The second thing you will eventually find with these people, in most cases, is sexual misconduct, immorality. It may go on secretly for some time before it is uncovered. Mo Berg did it. Stuart Trail approached at least one woman I know. There's the whole thing with his second wife. Sexual misconduct immorality is the second thing you'll eventually find. In the short term of a cult, these are the warning signs to get out. You'll see the sin of party spirit in some way related to Gnosticism. They have some slant on doctrine that others don't see. Mervyn Milne in Scotland with his, his view of covenant, to have some slant on doctrine that others don't see, and you have to be initiated into it. Eventually, eventually, you'll find this. If people don't get out then, you'll find this. Financial impropriety, exploitation. Very often they'll twist the Bible's teachings on things like tithing to do it. And immorality most frequently of a sexual nature, sometimes even a deviant sexual nature, with kids and all sorts. Now, let's begin to understand how this comes about. Before Satan paganized the church, 4th century, all that, Constantine, etc., we know from the New Testament his first trick was to Judaize it. I did not say Jewishize it. It is Jewish, theologically. Israel is the natural root. We should understand the scriptures from a Judeo-Christian perspective, not a Hellenistic one. The Lord revealed his word to a given people, a nation, with a given culture, and we have to understand that. It's necessary to theologically understand biblical Judaism to understand biblical Christianity. Jesus fulfills the law. 
His first seduction was to put people back under the law. Instead of the law pointing to Christ. Now, I'm not talking about observances. My family are Israeli Jews. My kids are born in Galilee. We keep the Passover for reasons of culture and testimony to unsaved Jews. There's a mezuzah on the door. We even speak Hebrew at home. We have Hanukkah. We have Purim. We have all the Jewish feasts. We go to a church on Sunday, but a Messianic fellowship on Saturday, Shabbat. I'm not talking about people who are culturally Jewish keeping their own culture to witness to Jews in their own culture. That's not wrong. Neither am I talking about people who witness to Jews adopting that culture for testimonial reasons, to acculturate, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. What I'm talking about is when you either say it is necessary for salvation or for sanctification. Well, you might be saved by grace, but when you say it's necessary for salvation, that is legalism. When you say it is necessary for sanctification, well, you're saved by Jesus, but you should also do this, this, this. That is known as nomianism, from the Greek word nomos. Okay, nomianism. Today there are two kinds of groups that you need to watch out for who are trying to live under two covenants. One is the extreme access of the messianic movement. I'm not talking about the good messianic Bible teachers like Arnold Fruchtenbaum. I'm not talking about people who help Christians to understand the Jewish background of the New Testament. I'm not talking about those who worship within a Jewish cultural framework in order to evangelize Jews. I'm not talking about that, about celebrate Messiah and Melbourne. I'm talking about those who try to make people keep the law in a compulsory way. David Chris is a dangerous, dangerous man. He's here in Melbourne. But he's not the only Messianic extremist. In England, they had one, Philip Sharp. He wound up in jail, abandoned his Israeli wife and children, and he had the people crown him King Messiah in the meeting. Messianic Jew, Jewish rabbi, quote-unquote. Some of these guys are nuts. There's some kind of halakha community up in Queensland. I wouldn't go near with a barge pole. Now, again, I'm not speaking against Arnold Fruchtenbaum or Art Katz. Or, you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about the good guys, the ones that are all right. I'm talking about the nuts. But it is not only Messianic Jews who are doing this, who are out to rebuild the wall of partition. There's another group of people who are trying to live under two covenants. Seventh-day Adventists. Most of the followers of David Koresh were Seventh-day Adventists. Pay attention. Once people get into one serious fundamental doctrinal error, like trying to live under two covenants, once people get into one doctrinal error, they become automatically prone to a more serious one. Hear what I said? Once people accommodate one fundamental doctrinal error, they automatically predispose themselves to something more serious and even more dangerous. I'll come back to Kodesh in a moment. It is only a matter of degrees. When I read about Kodesh, I couldn't believe it. But I had seen evangelical cults that could get people to do things that were unbelievable. When the thing with Kardash happened, I pulled 129 pages off the Internet, read it very carefully. David Kardash followed this pattern to a T. Now remember, Seventh-day Adventists who claimed to be born again, or at least saved. A lot of false doctrine. The party spirit, the Gnosticism, Nicolaitanism, and then the rest, going under the law. He would have 13-hour Bible studies, always about the book of Revelation and always about himself. He would become violently angry, 
chuck chairs and things. If people didn't pay attention or fell asleep during the 13-hour Bible studies. These Bible studies were all designed to brainwash people for a coming apocalyptic cataclysm of some description, in which they were led to believe by insinuation and by nuance, never, never directly stated, apparently, that their salvation would be through their relationship with him in this coming thing. They were so brainwashed that when they shot it out with the FBI, they believed that that was this coming event in Revelation. You understand? But it didn't begin that way. Why is going to make people do this? He had to become the sole authority figure. He had these people believing that he was semi-divine. You want to talk about a Gnostic. And therefore, only his semen was divinely imbued. So only he should procreate children. He didn't want husbands to be respected by their wives or children. So he got into this whole humiliation thing. He wanted people only to recognize his authority. He would have an attractive woman stand up in a meeting and make her lift up her dress. And then he'd go at the men like this, who's been aroused by this? And then he'd begin castigating them for lust, <laughs> publicly. This guy was a nut. He had a boudoir upstairs, a real boudoir. The men slept in military-style barracks. And only the women would go up, whichever one he summoned. Except these were not always adult women. They were children as young as 11. Many of those people were killed were undoubtedly people he fired, kids. So he would have to berate these men so their wives would not look upon them as a spiritual authority. Then he would humiliate women. He would do that differently. He made these Seventh-day Adventist-style dietary rules, which he would modify periodically. And if they went out and they bought the wrong kind of chicken or something, he would scream at the top of his lungs. Then he would post a list. And any one of the women whose name was on the list, they would queue up. He would strip them and beat them with a paddle. And they would always queue up every day if the name was on the list. They would, they would do it. Then they'd have to come out, undress in front of their children and say, you see what happened to bad mommies? Who's going to do this? How did he can get them to do this? Once somebody can get people to give your 11-year-old daughter, it's a natural next step that you'll die for that person. How did it begin? One serious false doctrine. Once somebody gets into one serious false doctrine, they become predisposed to another one. I was pretty shocked. And when you read things like Kingdom of the Cults and some of the stuff that Joseph Smith did, another sex pervert, perverted sex is a big thing among cults. Mormons with, you know how the fundamentalist Mormons? Well, like the, the, the true Mormons are the fundamentalist ones. They're the ones who really follow Brigham Young and uh, Joseph Smith. How do they get these eight wives and ten wives? We were doing an outreach to Mormons, Morial USA, uh, together with Jakarta Ministries, we're doing this outreach at Manti, Utah last year. In Manti, where the fundamentalist Mormons live. I met one of eight wives. How did these guys get these women to go along with this? That wasn't hard to guess. Guess how old they were when they married them. These guys are pedophiles. <laughs> That's how they do it. Kids. Kids. That, however, was David Kodesh. That's Mormons. I'll tell you something that frightened me even more. What about born-again Christians, saved Christians, who did the same thing? It was in the newspaper, front page of the New York Post in 1978. A cult that broke away from the Lutheran Church in Minnesota, Evangelical Lutherans. They were putting children into a metal chair, tying them down and giving them electric shocks for not playing attention in Sunday school, and the parents would stand there and watch the Sunday school teachers electrocute the kids. There was another one in California that would beat people to drive the demons out of them. And the people would allow themselves to be beaten. 
But this is the most shocking one. There was a young girl in England who was a law student, came to a few of our Bible studies. She was originally from Gibraltar. She spoke Spanish. Graduated, and she became involved with a cult called Rima, based in Spain, not Copeland's Rima, another Rima. Because she spoke Spanish, they sent her to Chicago to the Spanish-speaking ghettos. Her friends told me they were really concerned about this group. They had good reason to be concerned. But these are saved Christians. Same pattern, Gnosticism, heavy shepherding, Nicolaitanism, how dare you question us, all money to the group. Because she was bilingual and because she was educated, she had more freedom than the other women in the group. She was allowed to come out and meet me and my wife. This group, the leaders, were telling people who were clean to, by faith, marry people who are HIV positive and just trust the Lord. They were marrying people with AIDS. They were contracting AIDS. Babies were born HIV positive. People were dying. The leaders arranged the marriages and they actually signed their own death certificates with their marriage certificates and they died. These were born again. I took her to meet my wife. I talked to her. I phoned her parents in England. I took her to this rescue mission called Pacific Garden Mission. I said, lock her up. Don't let her out of here. I'll be back tomorrow. I gave him 50 bucks or whatever. And I got an airline ticket back to England. And I took her to O'Hare Airport. And I, after calling my parents, and I said, if I ever get you back on this side of the Atlantic again, lady, <laughs> that's 12 and a half extra wide. Guess what I'm going to do with it? They were telling people to marry people who were HIV. How did they get this kind of control? Didn't happen overnight. Began with party spirit, connected to Gnosticism, connected to Nicolaitanism. Now you have to understand further how this works. Once you forget Jesus is our wisdom, you begin looking to a man for the wisdom. You stop being a Berean, you stop testing things scripturally. You are forfeiting that person a kind of control of your life that God never wanted anybody to have except himself. And even he never enforces himself that way or manipulates. It gets to the point where even if they say and do things not biblical, people won't question. Even if they say and do things immoral, people won't question. They lose their capacity to think rationally. Again, it only becomes a matter of degree between the so-called Christian cults and the ones that are obviously pseudo-Christian. When we were in Utah last year, I had the discourses of Brigham Young. And the Mormons all had these t-shirts that said, Brigham Young said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's what they all said. Now, whenever you corner a Jehovah's Witness, they change the subject. That's what they're trained to do. Whenever you nail them down, something... A Mormon will revert to his testimony, the subjective proclamation of, I have a burden in my bosom and I testify to you the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. That's supposed to settle every issue. No matter how many logical arguments you can confront them with, they can't answer the testimony. It's supposed to be the ultimate explanation. It's a whole subjective thing. The Mormons came in to the Utah. We were there. And I saw your shirt. Hey, I like your shirt. I'm getting a crowd. Brigham Young said it, you believe it, that settles it. He said, hallelujah, whatever they said. So you believe this Quaker's living on the moon. Well, you said if Brigham Young said it, you believe it. This man believes this Quaker's on the moon because Brigham Young said it. He never said that. Oh, here it is. I got this from your church, the Journal of Discourses of Brigham Young. Joseph Smith said this Quaker's on the moon lived to be a thousand years old. And Brigham Young said they're on the sun, too. I saw a black guy. I said, hey, you know what? The New Testament says the first non-Jew to accept Christ, total non-Jew, was a black African, an Ethiopian. The first person, not from any Jewish background, that Jesus saved was a black man. But you know what the Mormon church said? You know what Brigham Young said about you? You're a descendant of fallen angels. You're ugly, mischievous, and depraved. Who do you want to follow? Jesus who loves you? Or a Mormon who says you're ugly, mischievous, and depraved, and a descendant of fallen angels, and calls you racist names. 
Here, Brigham Young said it. You believe it, it's on your shirt. This man is ugly, mischievous, and depraved because God made him black. You know what the Mormon said? I testify to you, I have a burning in my bosom, and I know the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. You know what I said to him? And I have a burning in my bosom, and I testify to you, I know this Quakers are living on the moon. <laughs> Logic goes out the window. The plain teaching of Scripture goes out the same window. Subjectivism steps in. Three times in First Peter. Three times. Let's look at it. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He's speaking eschatologically in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. What does he say? Therefore be of sound judgment and sober in spirit. Sound judgment and sober in spirit for the purpose of prayer. Remember the video of Rodney Howard Brown and Copeland? Just get drunk. Don't pray, don't pray. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Be drunk in spirit. Keep, remain sober in spirit. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on your alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I was once driving in a 4x4 four four from... Zambezi Valley, Victoria Falls, and the border between Zambia and, uh, and Zimbabwe. And I was on my way to a place called Bulawayo to speak at this church. And we're going through the bush. This is lion country. We see a giraffe. And the person driving me says, it's getting dark now. This time of night, lions stalk that kind of giraffe. So I'm looking out for lions. All of a sudden, there goes the wheel. Be sober in spirit. The lion's trying to get you. Boy, if I ever felt like getting drunk, it was then. <laughs> if I ever wanted if I ever wanted some whiskey, it was then. This was no Tarzan movie. This was the real bush in real Africa with real lions. It was getting dark, and I was scared. Oh, admittedly, I could only say two things. Lord Jesus and Jack Daniels. But the last thing I needed to be was in an inebriated state where I wouldn't be vigilant. Three times Peter says, be sober. Paul warns, but you be sober. In fact, the same Peter who they quote in Toronto meetings, they were drunk on the day of Pentecost, says these men are not drunk. They heard the mighty deeds of God, not drunk in hysterics. So you show them, wait a minute, the Bible says be sober, repeatedly, not drunk in spirit, as, as Rodney Howard Brown is teaching. You know, the pastor of Faithland here in Melbourne, he had five friends, he wasn't into Toronto, but he had five friends who were, five Pentecostal ministers. Some of them I had spoken in their churches in times past. And they all were into Rodney Brown. I showed them the videos of Rodney Brown in Copeland in Toronto. They couldn't defend what was on it. They knew it was heretical. They knew it was carnal, maybe even demonic. But they still insisted that they were going to go for Toronto and, and go see Rodney Brown. Why? They were not blind. They were willfully blind. These were the leaders misleading whole congregations. Jesus Christ will hold them accountable, as shepherds, it says in Peter, for misleading the flock. Well, what did these people say? Hey, wait a minute. The fruit of the Spirit is it crete in Greek, self-control. Ikrete. How do you say? Egatia, sorry. It's the blame the seminary. You gotta really know your Greek in Melbourne. <laughs> so you show them what it says in Peter, be sober, be sober, be sober. You're saying be drunk, be drunk. What did they answer? Did they answer biblically? No. Did they answer logically? No. Did they answer cultically? Yes. I was blessed. I know it was right because of what happened to me. What does a Mormon say? I got a burning in my bosom and I know it's true. Yeah, but it's not logical. Logic goes out the same window with the Bible. It's only a matter of degrees. There's not much difference anymore between the Assemblies of God and the Mormons. They're in the same way. One's just further down the same road. Now, there are some individual good Assemblies of God churches. I think they need to come out. 
in my opinion. You're going down the same road. It's only a matter of one is further down the other, down the other, that's all. The psychological bondage that happens has a demonic character. When the people leave, they are automatically ostracized by the other people still in the cult. It is like Catholicism, you left the one true church. Mortal sin, go to hell, go directly to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That's it, the unpardonable sin. You've touched God's anointed. God's anointed is not Rodney Brown, and it's certainly not Brian Houston. Neither is it David Chris or Lloyd, what's to say, Longfield. The other people will turn against you because you're free. They're in bondage. But are you free? No, they're not. Not right away. Not right away. You can take a person out of the cult, but they are so confused and have been so hurt and manipulated, it takes a longer time to take the cult out of the person. You know that song that, I never liked it, but the rock song, Welcome to the Hotel California, you can walk out any time you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> you can take the person out of the cult. But to take the cult out of them is not so easy. They remain in psychological and spiritual bondage to it, particularly if they were saved through it. And they can't be accommodated in other churches because other churches can't understand what they went through. And there's this secret fear they have. What if they were right? What if they were right? What if they were right? I know this and that was wrong, but what? And they go on and on. This battle takes place, and it sometimes goes on for years. Sometimes people have become, had mental breakdowns, nervous breakdowns, become mentally ill because of it. Some have turned to alcoholism and drugs. Some have committed suicide. Marriages have broken up because of it. This is terrible. Marriages, breaking up, people committing suicide, people going into drug and alcohol dependency. Another very common phenomenon is this. They've been so hurt or so burned, they could never trust another church or another leader again. The solution to a bad church for them becomes no church. The solution to bad leadership becomes no leadership. Now, actually, the solution to wrong leadership is right leadership. And the solution to bad church is good church. But they can't accept that. Others don't understand what they've been through. Don't understand what's going inside of them. They can come to the church, but they don't fit in. Until something happens. It takes time for that to happen, but it eventually happens. Let's come back to that in just a moment. Can I ask this question now? How many people here have either firsthand seen or experienced something like this? Put your hand up. Look around. Look around. This is a big problem and it is getting bigger. And before Jesus comes back, it'll be bigger still. This is an issue. I'm going to introduce you to a term sociologists use. Put this on, please. It was first formulated by a social psychologist named Leon Festinger. He was a social psychologist who was interested in the sociology and in the social psychology of religion. And he identified this phenomena. It was called cognitive dissonance. The sociologist's name was, I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but even secular psychology or sociology can see the phenomena. Cognitive dissonance says this, when people become cemented to a sect with this heavy control by the leadership, and the leaders make prophecies, predictive prophecies that fail to happen, instead of the people using their noggin and coming out, they will become even more committed to the sect. One of the things I do when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, I'd know that knock anywhere. As I bring them in and I show them back copies of the Watchtower, where their leaders have predicted things that have failed to happen. And I show them, even from the Watchtower, where it says in the Watchtower and Awake magazine, Deuteronomy 18, those predicting things that don't happen in God's name are false prophets. 
You show them from their own literature. Show them from the Bible. Even their own literature. Logic goes out the window. The Bible goes out the window. They can't see it. What do you do with the fact that men like General Coates predicted an earthquake in New Zealand never happened? The Elam cult, all 44 churches were taking survival course lessons. Or something like that with the Ian Bilby in New Zealand. What do you do with the fact that Rick Joyner has made major predictions in his book, The Harvest, that failed to happen? He said communism was going to be triumphant. Five months later, the Iron Curtain came down. What do you do with the Kansas City prophets, men like Paul Kane and Mike Bickle, who said the greatest revival in Britain's history would come to Great Britain in October of 1990 and fan out to Germany? In the last 10 years, more mosques have been built in England than churches. Men who have proven false prophets, Benny Hinn's false prophecies in New Zealand. Rodney Howard Browns, I saw him on TV in Australia with Phil Pringle predicting revival. It didn't come. What do you do with the fact that these men make predictions that don't happen? The Deuteronomy 18 says, get away from them. Don't be afraid of them. Have nothing to do with them. In a cult, though, it doesn't matter. Is there any difference between what the Jehovah's Witnesses do or the Mormons? Because their, their leaders made false prophecies, too. Is there any difference between the Jehovah's Witnesses and the people who will still listen to Benny Hinn, Rodney Brown? No, there's no difference. No. They've only gone further down the same road. This is known as cognitive dissonance. Even secular psychology can identify it. Even the world sees it for what it is. They become more committed to it. They'll always make an excuse and defend it or set another date or something like this. Then when that doesn't happen, we got that one wrong. Same as the Jehovah's Witnesses. These guys have predicting revival for years. No revival comes, so they'll get another one. When Toronto doesn't come, we'll get the Alpha. When Alpha doesn't work, we'll get the, we'll, we'll get the Pensacola. When Pensacola doesn't work, we'll get Pepsi-Cola. When that doesn't work, we'll try 7-Up. It doesn't matter. Get some gold teeth. It'll always be the next fad. People will swallow anything. Why? Because they have become incorporated into a cult. It is cultic. You understand? It's following men. Yeah, but the Word of God says I shouldn't listen to you anymore. It doesn't matter to them. They're in bondage, and it's terrible. I know people, the people are dead. Christians, saved Christians are dead. Families and marriages have been destroyed by these kinds of people. Not only that, but these people are frauds and charlatans themselves. They're highly insecure and usually don't know a fraction of what they want you to think they know. And would fear anybody who does know more than they do. That's what will demean any kind of educational learning. They're as bad on one extreme as those who lift it up and make a god of it on the other. Paul says, I don't have you to be ignorant brethren. I don't care if like Arnold Fuchtenbaum said, I don't care if you're Plymouth brethren, I don't care if you're open brethren, I don't care. <laughs> but don't be ignorant brethren. Boy, they're ignorant brethren. Now, if somebody was saved through this, and it was the only thing they ever knew, you can understand how it can happen to them, you understand? But what happens when people get into this who were not saved through it? <laughs> That's even worse in terms of being more pathetic. So suppose you've been in one of these groups. I don't even know you. I don't know what group you're in. But I guarantee this. It followed the same pattern I showed you, didn't it? The way the leader operates. The fear of knowledge. Anybody who knows what he doesn't. Using others to be his messengers, his gophers. He has some special insight into the Bible. If you don't see it, you're into rebellion. If you don't submit to his authority, others turn against you and put you under condemnation. We're putting a curse under you. You're going to die. Your children are going to die. They'll always tell you about the people who left the group and died. They won't tell you about the ones who stayed and died. They're very selective about how they handle things. These people operate just like the Sanhedrin. Jesus said to the Sanhedrin, why do you arrest me and bring me in here for a kangaroo trial? You say that in Australia? I guess you must. Why didn't you come after me in the temple? Everybody could see it. 
These guys will never openly debate in front of the video camera or in an auditorium, in front of the open public. It always has to be in front of their cronies. Michael Brown, the deceiver of Pensacola, their so-called theologian, supposed to be the great Hebrew scholar. I called him up, he called me, I, Shalom Maslam Ha, Kodeseda, Ekata. He couldn't even speak a word of Hebrew. He came to Israel some years earlier. He said that the national forest fires, which destroyed 22% of Israel's forests, was the God's emblem of the Holy Spirit's fire being poured out on Israel. He had people up all night waiting for the second Pentecost event. Now he's gone to Pensacola. He was supposed to debate me about Pensacola. I said, okay, we make the date. It's supposed to be in a, in a church near New York, midweek, so people could come from any church without missing their own church, at a neutral venue, midweek. He finds out I have the Joe Chambers videos where Patrick is caught lying about the vibrating girl and all this. Right away, he cancels the debate. He demands it be held at a Pensacola place on a Sunday night. Why? Because cult leaders, they'll always only fight you on their own turf. It'll always be the Sanhedrin putting Jesus on trial. They'll never stand openly. It has to be only where they control people, who they can get on. You understand? They'll never go into a fair fight. They will never go into a fair fight. They don't have the ability or the guts. These are insecure people. That's how they operate. You're afraid of a tiger with no teeth. These people are frauds. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it's even taken people years. To take that person out of that central role in your life and put Christ in that role instead. These people are in unspeakable bondage. And unless you have been in that bondage, you don't understand where they're coming from. You won't be able to, even to grasp what their problem is. Why can't they fit in? Not only that, they'll even say a lot of true things. The church is lukewarm. The cult was more zealous. You're Laodicea. Well, that's true. That's the danger. They're not just telling lie lies. They're telling Satan's lies, perversions of truth. But look at the results. Look at the damage. You'll find it every time. They begin as sociologically cults, theologically churches. Give them a few years, not more than ten. Then you'll find heresy. You'll find financial corruption. You'll find immorality. But maybe at the end of it, you'll find Jesus. If you are in bondage to one of these groups. It says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. By virtue of the fact that you are in bondage tells you that's not God's Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. By virtue of the fact that you are in bondage, that tells you it's not of God's Spirit. It is a different spirit, party spirit, a deed of the flesh, a sin, it, the opposite of the fruit of the spirit. The deeds of the flesh are the opposite of the fruit of the spirit. You're in bondage. Might take a couple of months. Sometimes it's even taken people a couple of years. But the sum of the matter is this. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And eventually, you have that bondage. One verse will become a reality like you've never known. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube, deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a 
at the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book, and the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.